thank you so much, Amy, for a kind introduction, and congratulations, Mark. It's, it's terrific. You're doing this very, very, very important job, which we all are very grateful for. It's great to be back in Pittsburgh. I had at least a couple of decades of my early life here. I have great memories of the place. It really is good to be back. Lynn and I walked across the Smithfield Bridge last night, looked at that great Monongahela River. I explained it's going to meet with the Allegheny and the Ohio, and it's just so many great stories. I, um, I want to tell two quick stories that I remember, sometimes remember things. I remember my family came here. We had an apartment in Whitehall. <clears throat> it overlooked the slag dump. The slag dump was incredible. It would light up as, this, as the cars dumped the molten slag uh, and just the whole sky. I, this is the end of the world for a little kid. It's just, it's just I, I, somehow I never got that out of my mind. The other thing which is so memorable is the 1960 Pirates Yankees World Series. <laughs> I, I just remember that so well. Mazeroski, walk off, home run in ninth, seven games. It was just, and then heroes like Roberto Clemente, just uh, such, such good, good, uh, good memories. My parents were wise enough to think that I should go to Shadyside. I was a little apprehensive at the time, the other side of town from Whitehall. My kids weren't, my friends weren't going there, but they said, well, just, just stick with it, see what you think. So I went, and the first week or so, I figured I'd try out for the football team. I remember one of the first things I had to do was tackle Bob Maloney. <laughs> it was frightful. This guy running down, and we just had a little, I had to get, get, anyway, I tackled him. I tackled Mike, too. So the coaches figured, hey, this guy's pretty good. He called me tough as, nail, tough as nails Taylor. I don't know why, but anyway, I loved that. And as a result of that, I love Shadyside. I think like many young kids, it's not really the beginning. The, the studies don't get you going. It's other things, and that got me going. It was other things eventually, of course. Um, the teachers were incredible. Uh, I got to like science, and I got to like math. And I learned clever things. One thing I remember, I learned the term WGAD. This was a technique for taking notes. And uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Sales, but he disputes it was him that taught me this. Maybe it was Mr. Abercrombie. WGAD meant who gives a damn, darn, sorry. <laughs> and you put that in your notes at places that you didn't know if it was important enough at the time. It may be back later, but it was a signal, hey, I'm not sure if this fits into the discussion. It was like an anecdote or something. So I learned WGAD, I used it all my life. <clears throat> It's one of these things you're a little, a little afraid sometimes you give some people just part advice. So in, in college, it was the weekend before the test, I had to go somewhere else and my friends asked if they could use my notes. I said, sure, here's, you can use my notes. I didn't think much about the WGADs, but they were there. So I got back Sunday night, the test was Monday morning, they said, hey, thanks so much. We really memorized the WGADs. By the way, what does that mean? <laughs> So it's one of those lessons, you know, when you give advice or give some thoughts, make sure you give some background uh, when, you, when you do that. So in college, uh, I took these ideas of science and math, which I got to like at Shadyside, and thought that the social issues were maybe just as important to me, more interesting than the physical issues. And so I got interested in economics, which is really the application of the math and science techniques to, to society's problems, the problems of economics. And I really got into that. I, I majored in the subject. I write a, wrote an honors thesis on economics, got my PhD in economics, became a professor of economics, loved teaching economics, did research in economics, and as Amy indicated, took as many economic jobs as I could find and were offered to me in Washington because I think the applications of the subject to me is what really gave me a rush. It, the subject is beautiful, as many subjects are, but the applications were very, very important. And so I had an opportunity to do that at, uh, at several times in my life. During this period, I talked a lot about economics, and uh, it's a long span of time, of course. And the US economy, other economies have had ups and downs. And I, as a, economist 
who studies the macroeconomy or monetary economics, the ups and downs have always fascinated me. So in the 50s and 60s, it was pretty good, pretty much up. In the late 60s and 70s, when I really started studying the subject, the 60s and 70s, it wasn't so good. Inflation rising, growth was slow. Then it picked up again in the 80s and 90s, good times. And then recently, not so good. I'd say since the great, terrible Great Recession of uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, and the slow growth since, since then, say 2003 to 2016 or so. And so I've talked a lot about that, and I've thought that the not so good last period, and of course these are ups and downs. Fortunately, the ups are more important than dead downs, so we, we have had growth and progress, and, and standards of living have improved in the United States. But those ups and downs are important, and I think to some extent recently <clears throat> we've been in a bit of a down. And I've written about it and talked about it uh, quite a bit. And I'm particular, re particularly referring to the the Great Recession period, 2008, 9, and then the slow recovery from that, I think it's slow, 2% or so, and uh, wrote about it, and I, I blamed it on policy, actually, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. I blamed it on policy, the Great Recession, not such good monetary policy, the slow recovery, not so much good fiscal and other kinds of policies. And so I want to talk a little bit about whether we're perhaps coming out of that, whether there's some changes that are going to, going to affect that. One thing I've noticed in discussing the times are not so great, say 2006, 2016, is that other people had different views in mind. My was, mine was to think about my research and think about my work and say, well, it's policy. But others had different views. One was, hey, we had this great recession. It, was, it just happened. It wasn't policy. It just happened. And of course, you get slow growth after recessions automatically. So the, slow 2% growth following that recession to be expected. Others began to, and that, that didn't occur right away, it occurred after the growth was slow. And then another view, which went viral, became very popular, was that we had, a, it was a secular issue. Growth is just gonna be slow for the foreseeable future. Secular stagnation, it was sometimes called. That also came, maybe the first, first proposed, I remember, um, by, uh, by Larry Summers, who was President of Harvard, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, around 2012. And that has surprised me because I didn't say anything secular about this, it was policy, but that went viral, just as things do these days. And so that was another thing, don't, don't worry about it, it's just the way it is. And a third thing which I've been noticing more recently is that, so what if growth is slow? I mean, there's other things important in life besides growth. And I don't think that, and I've just been thinking more about it recently, and I think a lot of the problems that have been ailing the economy, we just had a talk uh, last week by the people, people, economists who were focusing on the terrible opioid crisis, the so-called deaths of despair, and some people think that's because the economy overall has not been going so well. So I think the slower growth that we've had, and I got to focus on that decade or so, is, is still problematic. So that gets to the current changes and whether we're seeing some changes that address this problem. Is, are we once again coming out of this as we have in the past? Well, there's been some changes in policy. And I'm gonna talk about those. I don't like all of them, I like some of them. And I'm uh, gonna talk the, the taxes and the budget, et cetera. But the truth is, in the last two years, we've had higher growth. It's really just gone up and up each, if you do four quarter average, up and up each quarter. And for the last year, last calendar year, it's been 3%. So it just chugged up from less, less than two to three. And it looks like the first quarter data, which are gonna be coming out next week, are gonna be close to three as well. We don't know if the data come out and there's been some lags, but it looks like there's a change. And I think there's change in the data. And the question is whether that change had anything to do with the policy. I'm going to argue it has. I'm going to do it in the following way. I like to think of growth, and let's just say 2% growth versus 3%. I mean, over time, it sounds small, but over time, it's, it's really the big difference, 2 versus 3. How do you get from 2 to 3? Well, you either have to have more people working, or you have to have more production per worker. One's called productivity, the other's called labor force participation. The forecast 
which really perpetuates the poor performance of recent years has been we're going to get slow on both. Slow productivity growth and slow labor force growth. You can actually sum these two things to get growth. So the 2% growth, which we've had recently in the forecast, is the sum of 1.5% productivity growth and half percent employment growth. So 1.5 plus a half is 2. That's, that's how it's been. So I'd like to think with the right policies, you can change that. You can have higher productivity growth and higher labor force growth. Make it simple, 2 plus 1 is 3. 2% 2 productivity growth, 1% labor force employment gives you the 3. So what have we done in policy that could possibly bring that about? And I think that's the way to think about it. There, there's other ways to think about it. People think about, well, more demand, more deficits, more spending. Some people refer to the idea that it's a sugar high, the deficit has increased. Uh, I'll come back to that. And so it's been a sugar high. That's why the economy is going well. I think it's more on these other, other elements. And that's what's going to, if it's going to continue, if we're going to get off, if this jump is going to continue, it's going to be because it's more of these steady productivity and labor force growth issues. So what could grow, raise productivity growth? What could make employment more attractive for firms creating the jobs? Well, let's go through the policies. So I'm going to talk about tax policy. I'm going to talk about regulatory policy. I'm going to talk about monetary policy. I'm going to talk about international policy and the budget in the next 10 minutes. Tax policy, the bigger cha biggest change is December of 2017, where a tax reform was put through. I think many people didn't think that was, happen ha was going to happen, but it happened. There's lots of elements uh, of that. My friends in California complain all the time that their taxes have increased because the rate didn't go down too much at the personal level, but they didn't get these big deductions for state and local taxes. And it's true. Some of the wealthier people actually pay more tax. But the change, which I think is most important for my analysis and argument, is that there's been a reduction in the tax on businesses, from 35 percent to 21 percent for corporations, also a reduction in tax rates for small businesses, an uh, expensing of investment uh, for a number of years, depends on whether it will continue or not, a um, international tax system which is more favorable uh, to, to investment in the U.S. and a repatriation where some of the investments abroad could come back to the U.S. So all these things, by my calculations, by actually almost all economists' calculations, they reduce the tax on investment. They reduce the tax on capital. And so by any reasoning, they should in, increase investment. They should in, increase capital. And what does that do? It means that workers have more capital, more tools, better tools, more technology to work with, and therefore more productive. So higher productivity should come from the investment that's caused by that. That's the argument that I would make and have made of why I think productivity growth has begun to increase in this period. It's not an argument you hear that much, but it's a little technical, but that's what I stress uh, and I've always stressed. It will also, of course, make firms more uh, willing to hire. But there's something else which I think will help in that respect, too. And that is my second, second on the list, and that's regulatory policy. So regulatory policy is in the weeds for most people. It's hard to think about it as tax and deficit. It's a, it's a more microeconomic issue. But as I look at the regulatory changes, I see some pretty significant ones. Early on in uh, 2017, there was the Congressional Review Act, which went through various uh, acts in Congress that had uh, negative economic effects and either repeal them or change them. That was the beginning. And there were some various executive orders that were issued. What I think is most important for me is the appointments. And I just, there's a, and this is a, this, this talk is, is meant to be just the facts, if you like. So I don't, I don't want to talk about why things happen, what, what the, what the politic, politics of this are. There's enough of that. <laughs> this is the economics. And so there were appointments. And I would think of Ajit Pai at the FTC. So net neutrality is gone. There's a big effort to have the private sector deal with the 5G. Uh, Jay Clayton, the SEC, the fiduciary rule, the liquidity rule are being modified. For a while, you had uh, Mick Mulvaney uh, in charge of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He's now in the White House, acting um, chief of staff. 
but there were changes there. And Naomi Rao, who was OMB in charge of regulation, she's now a judge. Um, Rick Perry, you forget him now, he's Secretary of the Energy, a lot of regulatory stuff on the, on the uh, pipelines. So these people had different attitudes about regulation. I think of it personally as they talk about the costs as well as the benefits of regulation. We of course need regulations, we just don't want to have the costs of the regulations outweigh the benefits. Benefits are important and so I think to the, to the most extent, and you can think about these individuals themselves, you can think about the actions, but that is a difference. And I would argue that's been a positive difference from the point of view of firms expanding, firms um, hiring, et cetera. And so that's the second on my list. Third on my list is monetary policy, which is in the papers all the time. It's a subject that I have loved all my life um, and I still love. I have a lot of criticisms about monetary policy in the Great Recession. Alan Greenspan is a close personal friend, but I criticize him for that particular move and uh, some of his successors. I think in the last, again, it's quite remarkable, 2017, 2018, there have been substantial changes in monetary policy. And this didn't just begin with Jay Powell, who's the current chair, it really began with Janet Yellen, who was the chair before him. But in 2017, they began to normalize in a substantial way. Normalize to an economist means bring interest rates back to the kind of levels that applied in similar circumstances in the past. And they began to adjust their, their balance sheet, which had gotten big because they bought, in a very unusual way, a lot of corporate securities. And so that began in 2017. They also began to have some appointments and people speaking about monetary policy, including Janet Yellen. She talked about the importance of predictable policies. I like to call it rules-based policies. And for the first time ever, the Fed began to publish, in 2017, the rules that guide them, the policy rules. One of them is, is sometimes called the Taylor Rule. So for that and other reasons, of course, I was ha quite happy about it. But the, uh, but the main thing is more rules-based policy. So you could see that happening. And then you had um, uh, appointments being made before the chair. Uh, Randy Quarles, who by the way has, I think, been positive on the, on the regulatory side. He's a close friend, he worked for me at the Treasury. We think a lot alike about monetary policy and the notion of rules and strategies. We had John Williams, who recently was moved from the San Francisco Fed, where he was president to the New York Fed. It's uh, probably by any dimension a more significant job, though. We miss him on the West Coast. He's a student of mine a PhD student, close friend, and we think a lot alike on things. Rich Clarity is now the vice chair, similar kind of thing. So the, the appointments and the statements and the policies, I think, were, were I use the pat word past tense, were going the right direction. I think in the last uh, couple months, there's lots of dispute about this. The president began to uh, comment, called the policy crazy, said he, he stuck with the chair, it was quite, quite dramatic. And of course, they have changed their policy. It's not quite as, no, as normalization as they can. I think whether you like that change or not, it's a little more confusing to me about what's going on. It's, they're not emphasizing the roles as much, and it's not clear, it's not clear to what extent it has had uh, effects. And so we'll see, that's not, it's not played out. It really hasn't affected their decisions yet, but it will by the end of this year. So it's a little mixed bag. In fact, I would say the changes that they began to make again, in 2017, um, before the new chair came in, have been positive. One of the reasons why I think growth has picked up. So we hope that they, I hope they don't deviate from that too much. Um, these monetary issues delve into international issues, which are quite remarkable. As the Fed began to do these unusual policies, very low interest rates, big purchases of, of uh, securities, so did other countries. Began with Japan. And I think if they followed the Fed, they saw that the Fed's policy made the dollar weak compared to the yen. The yen got strong. So there was an election in Japan, Abe won, he appointed Haruhiko Kuroda to be the president, uh, or the governor of the Bank of Japan, said we need you to do what the Fed is doing, and he did. And so there was a depreciation of the yen, they had their own unusual policy, they have negative interest rates now. And then in 2014, and by the way, I know Haruhiko very well, we talk a lot, so I, I have a sense of what he was doing. He means well. 
Uh, Mario Draghi is the president of the European Central Bank, then followed. In 2014, he gives a speech, the dollar's too strong, we need, need to do something about it. So they did their own uh, policy. So they have negative interest rates now, and as a result, Switzerland has negative interest rates. So it's a very unusual situation. And I'm hoping that the U.S. normalization will be good for the world because it would be a better world if we had a normal monetary policy, not this very unusual circumstance. And that's one of the things that we argued for in this so-called eminent persons group that, uh, that Amy referred to because there is a lot of concern internationally about capital moving around, go to the wrong places, going too fast. You know, Brazil was originally complaining. I think a lot of it was their own problems. But these have caused uh, capital movements and exchange rate volatility, so the world is less stable as a result. And my feeling is if the Fed no continues to normalize, get back to normal, it will not only be good for the U.S. economy, but it will be good for the world economy. And that's one of the things that we stress in this uh, report that the G20 uh, set up. We'll see if it actually happens. So that brings me to the international trade, international finance, international trade. Trade is not done. In fact, trade is very controversial. Um, I remember during the campaign, Donald Trump gave a speech down in Manesson. I wasn't in Manesson. I know Manesson. I've been in this area. And it was appealing to the bad guys abroad who are making trouble for you, steel workers. Very appealing viewpoint. Um, I remember well, when he was president, and he had, when he is president, he had a meeting in the White House, and he's speaking at a podium, and on his right were union workers, uh, steel workers, coal workers, whatever it happens to be. And they, he was announcing his steel and aluminum tariffs, and of course, they liked that, right? And on his right were his advisors. And at that time, he read, President Trump read a tweet, read a tweet from Elon Musk. Musk, Musk produces cars out where I live. And um, it was a note saying, uh, Mr. President, I don't know if he said Mr. President, but it was in a tweet. Um, when I export a Tesla to China, I pay a 25% tariff. If a car comes to the U.S. from China, they pay a 2.5%. 25, 2.5, that is not fair. You've got to fix that. It's not good for America. So in some sense, they brought attention to these disparities. And I. I worked in trade. I, have, I haven't seen more attention publicly to this than, than now. And so that has changed the dialogue, and it's, sometimes, it's worrisome because you don't want to have a protectionist world. You want to have a world, I, I'm a free trader, you want to have a world where, where there's few impediments to trade. But this has changed the circumstance because one of the ways the uh, administration is thinking of reducing tariffs abroad is to threaten with tariffs here. So it's a negotiating strategy. And it's not done yet. We'll see what happens. I think the pro one promising thing is the North American Free Trade Agreement got translated into this USMCA. It's not passed, but it's, it's, at least it's not a trade war. and it's, it's, it's more reasonable than one might have expected. It's not done yet. It's, uh, it's, it's still in the Congress. The discussion with Europe, I think, has improved. Uh, the, it was a meeting with uh, Trump and Juncker uh, the, at the uh, European Commission, and they talked about reducing tariffs jointly, production jointly. So that's positive. China, we don't know. It's not done. And the Chinese haven't really agreed to some things specifically, as far as I know. I'm not in the negotiating rooms. But we hope that works, in which case it will be a positive. It may be reducing tariffs. It may be in release, uh, reducing the impediments of foreign companies investing in China. But if that occurs, and as a result, the steel and aluminum tariffs and other restrictions are reduced, I think that would be, that would be good. But it is not done yet. So it's, to me, a question mark. And, it, and that uncertainty could be a negative for the economy. A lot of people think it is. But I, but I think you think of this in the context. This is a world in which the U.S. had reduced its barriers quite a bit for, for many years. People like me have argued for it. China and others didn't do that. So what do you do in those circumstances? The usual methods, you know, we could say we'll reduce our tariffs from 2.5 to zero. China says, okay, we'll reduce ours to 23.5. That's not exactly what you want to have happen. So there seems to be another way to, uh, to remedy this. And that's the, that's the idea. 
The last on my list is the budget policy, and quite frankly, this worries me more than anything. Um, the budget is getting bigger, budget deficit is getting bigger. The deficits are now trillion dollars a year. Um, I've noticed a great deal of complacency about the subject, um, but all over Washington. I've never quite seen it like this before. Last year, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, and it was, it was joint with such people as George Schultz, saying the deficit is too big, we need to do something about it. Never been attacked more in my life from an op-ed, which I thought was pretty much just straight economics. But, but there is an antagonism that we shouldn't worry about the deficit. Um, you can sort of see it all over the place. You know, people like Paul Ryan, who used to talk about it, He's gone. He's, he's not even a voice. In fact, he's criticized a lot for that. So it worries me, and it, it could get out of control. Deficit gets bigger, interest rates get higher, deficit gets bigger, it could spiral. We're not there yet. There's still time to deal with it. For, for the most part, and this is why it's hard to deal with, for the most part, it's because the, uh, the, the spending on transfers, some so-called entitlements, not the best word, is increasing quite rapidly and tax revenues are just increasing modestly. And so you have this big gap, and who wants to touch that? It's very, very unpopular to touch that at, that at this point. So we haven't done much, and I think if I would think about the policies, that's the one that worries me the most. I'm wondering if, as people get more extreme, it's saying the deficit doesn't matter, perhaps wiser voices will have, get more angry about it, and, and they'll do something, we'll have to see, but, but it's, it's tough to deal with. I actually think that many of the programs that are growing rapidly would work better with uh, some spending control than we have now. So anyway, that's the, that's the list. You can see it's kind of a mixed bag. I'm probably more positive than the average commentator on TV. Um, and because I do think, and I, I can't help but be, because I've been arguing for 10 years that we needed to have tax reform, we needed to have regulatory reform, we needed to have monetary reform. And if we did, we'd have growth. Well, we had some of those. And growth has picked up. So I can almost say I told you so. It would be crazy if I didn't say I told you so. Of course, I'm always worried we have a recession tomorrow, in which case my told you so will look, will look kind of silly. But I think that's the case. Now, I am worried about this nonetheless, because we don't know where, this is still just past tense. We don't know where it's going. There's a lot of talk about uh, changing the policies. The tax cut was terrible. There's lots of doubts about the regulatory appointments. It's becoming very political these days. You can't say anything without being attacked politically from one side or the other. And I think so there is a, is a concern, and we'll go back on these policies, which, as you can see, I think are positive based on my studies and analysis. But moreover, there's even a global issue here about policies. I, as I think the countries that are viewed as successful have ones that have not really followed China. You know, what's, China is viewed as very successful. And, there's disputes about why. Actually, if, if you were to ask me, China is successful because they adopted market principles in 1980 with Deng Xiaoping, and growth has, has gone bananas since then. They're having some troubles now keep keeping that going. But there are debates, well, that's a better way than the United States. And, and by the way, don't worry about the deficit. We, we, the dollar will be, all, always be strong. So there's a concern out there that I see, and at it, 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 the least, it may stop the positive changes that I think are good, or delay the, the remaining changes that need to be done, or even worse, uh, bring about a complete change. And remember, just the history that I talked about, the 50s and 60s being good, the late 60s and 70s not so good, the 80s and 90s pretty good and not so good now. Well, these are ups and downs, which are inherent. You know, and I think they're a lot related to policy. We seem to be coming out of this one, but it's not over. And I think the, that sticking with it and thinking about it and discussing it, discussing the economics in my case, is very essential. If we, if we don't stick to the principles, it won't be successful. I think that's what evidence shows. If we look at countries around the world, look at the U.S. itself. And so if we don't stick to it, it won't be successful. And um, got to have the faith that these principles will work. Um, it reminds me of Shady Sai's motto in Latin. I actually took Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was my first year. Fide semper vincere. Faith 
will conquer. We will continue with good prosperity if we, read the, we use the right policies. There is, of course, debate of what the principles are, what the policies are. Let's have that debate, but let, let's not lose the idea that we want to have a stronger economy, reducing poverty, making lives better, and that's ultimately a policy issue. Thank you. Maybe there's some questions. Yeah. Okay, right over here first. Look, did you ever think you would, did you ever think you would see negative interest rates and to the extent and the level of negative interest rates and how to people that think normally, how can that make any sense? Yeah, well, I never forecast it. Um, it was brought on by policy makers, right? They, 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 it is possible for a central bank to have a negative interest rate because it's determining the rate it pays on reserves. So that's what's going on in, in Japan and Europe. So it's feasible, I just never thought I'd see it. I don't think it's the right policy. And one of the reasons is um, it's, it's really not market, a market determined rate. It is an administered rate. And it's decided by these agencies. They, they think, again, they think they're in the right job. There's arguments that the normal interest rate has just declined. And so we've got to have a negative interest rate for a while. But the negative interest, rate, interest rates don't feed back to, uh, to other parts of the economy. I think it squeezes the profits of institutions uh, that are making loans, so loans are not as high as before. Uh, there's not, and, and even worse perhaps, if we do have another downturn, where do you go? Even You can't really have much more negative interest rates. So I, I don't like it. It's, it's distressing it's been there for so long. You know, maybe for a while we could have done it, but the U.S. hasn't done it, and I hope they don't, but there's lots of talk about it. We're, we're having a meeting in a couple weeks, and someone's going to make the case for that so we can have a good debate. But I, I just want to, I would never have forecast that. Uh, I would never have recommended it. Um, and uh, we'll see if it really, if it becomes the way central banks operate in the future. Um. You mentioned a couple things in your talk. Um, one of them was the taxes in California. And for, for politics, a lot of things get discussed, such as what you're talking about, the state taxes and the impact of the salt. The talking point is that the tax cuts were only for the rich, but the reality is the people that, that are impacted are the ones that are you know, paying those, right. those high state taxes. Um, and the same thing when you were talking about deregulation and lower taxes and that spurring the growth. It's pretty obvious, especially from the economics studies that I had in college. Um, can you comment on what you think about the politics of economics? Because it seems like a lot yeah. of economists these days don't agree with some of the, the very basic uh, economic provisions that have been in place. Yeah, I think so. First of all, the effect on the rich and the poor and the income distribution, lots of debate about that. The income distribution does seem to have shifted in the direction of the rich compared to the poor. That's in the data. And the question is, what do you do about that? I think if you look at, um, again, some evidence around the country, I blame a lot of that on education um, and technology, not these other things. Um, so I'm, I'm from California. I mentioned that California has the highest poverty rate in the country. It's the richest state and the highest poverty rate. It makes no sense. Um, one of the reasons, and it's taking cost of living into account, of course. One of the, and the California also has a very poor K-12 education system. It's next to last in the country by scores. Say eighth grade Hispanic scores are next to last in the country um, in math. California, and then you look at Texas, also a border state, uh, it's like second or third in the country. So there's a lot that could be done. It's more of a state and local issue, in my view, but I don't, I don't think we should ignore that income distribution change. Um, and uh, that's what I, why I think growth, higher growth would be better if you're thinking about growth things. And in, in addition, a lot of the, in addition to making better education, um, uh, there's other things you can do to have more possibilities for, for people that are not doing well, more opportunities. And part of that is more jobs, I think, is part of it. But then the other part of your question is, say that the tax changes um, 
on a state and local tax deduction, yes, I mean, there's a, it's a big hit for some people, and it depends on your circumstances. There is a rate reduction, too. In a way, it's, it's, a, it's, it's good because it simplifies the tax, and you, for me, you would like to have a tax system with lower rates and a broader base. That's ideal tax reform, lower rates, broader base. So it is lower rates, but it's a much broader base, and it's particularly large for countries that high, had high taxes at the state and local level. But I think the income distribution is, is very important to me. It's most of a concern if it reflects uh, unequal opportunity. And I think it is reflecting unequal opportunity in the country, in certain sectors, se sections of the country. And I mean, you, this, this southwestern Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky is a lot of the places which people have pointed to as some of the problems. But I, so I think a better overall economy would be the place, at least I would start, but and also look at these other microeconomic things. I don't want to say it's not a problem. I think it's a real serious problem. But I don't think we're going to attack that by raising taxes, making regulations more strict, having a big budget deficit, and things like that. Yeah, right here. Yes, Dr. In the hindsight, what effect did quantitative easing have on interest rates and on inflation? So I've been quite critical of quantitative easing. The question is, what did quantitative easing do on interest rates, for example? I was just getting to that. I was just getting to that, and it's a. Uh, it simply means that the the central bank, the Fed in our case, buys securities, buys treasury bills, and, and they, they finance that by borrowing from banks. It's quantitative because it's buying things rather than just changing the interest rate that they usually look at, the federal funds rate. So that's why it's called quantitative. It's called easing because the, you'd hope that's easing. You hope, for example, that buying 10-year treasuries will raise the price of 10-year treasuries and lower their yield. So lowering the yield is viewed as an easing. So that's why it's called it's quantitative and while it's called, called easing. So um, there's mixed evidence about its working. Uh, this is one of those things about government. Most people at the Fed think it works. Many people outside the Fed don't think it works. And uh, I'm one of the people who's skeptical about it. Wrote a paper about it when it just began. So, um, but there, it's, it's hard to tell. It's, it's very hard to tell what the impacts are. But I think the main thing they find is that if there's an announcement they're going to do this quantitative ease, and that is buy, say, 10-year treasuries, they do see an effect on the yield at the time of the announcement. To me, that doesn't prove it works because they can't trace what happens in the weeks or months later. And I know this from working in the U.S. Treasury on exchange markets. Um, I made sure that the, the, we didn't intervene in the, chain, in the exchange markets at all while I was in charge, but the Japanese did. But I really wanted the, my Japanese colleagues to tell me when they intervened, and they did. And so I could see the, the yen dollar move, and it did move when they announced the intervention, but it almost always went back, and there were some things that no one would ever trace. And then if you just, a lot of the economics are that it shouldn't have, should not have big effects. Um, it's not just the 10-year yield, it's the five years, the six years, all sorts of yields that are together. So, so I'm skeptical about it, to answer your question. You, um, but it has spread globally, and I think the, the reason it spread is not so much the interest rate as the exchange rates, and it does have effect on exchange rates. It did have an effect originally of, of making the dollar weaker, and then the Japanese yen weaker and the ECB weaker. So that's an international thing, which I think is there. But in terms of interest rates, in terms of the overall economy, I, I see a little effect. And after all, we have had we had a terrible recovery until quantitative easing stopped. That doesn't prove anything, but it is uh, does make you think that it wasn't all that effective. Anyway, that's my view of that. Yeah. Okay. Here and then here. Yeah. Okay. There and here. I have two questions regarding economic policy. On the one hand, uh, you hear a number of the Democratic candidates espouse MMT, modern uh, macroeconomic, modern macro, macro theory, um, which believes an explosion of the debt has no issue on our economy. I can't imagine who would support that. 
On the other, and on the other side, um, Jan Heitzes, who is the chief economist at Goldman Sachs, who I respect greatly, wrote a piece recently talking about recessions may be a thing of the past. That we could continue to grow at a 2% rate for quite some time without the impact of a recession. Um, can I get your views on both of those? So the um, modern monetary theory, and, and by the way, Amy, when you introduced me, you used the word modern monetary theory as me. It's probably what it says, but I never thought that I used that term. I probably did, because what a great term, modern monetary theory. So, I, but <laughs> that's fine. It's not, not a criticism, just an observation. But modern monetary theory now conveys this idea that um, uh, AOC and others have uh, advocated that it is simply, I think of it as because the U.S. has the dollar, which is a strong currency, we don't need to worry about deficits. People will buy our debt around the world so we can have deficits. Don't worry about it so much. It's, uh, there's, when you say that, they sort of change it a little bit, but, and it's been criticized quite a bit by uh, so-called mainstream economists. Uh, I don't know where it'll play out. Uh, it's got such a nice term, and it's you know politically popular. If you know, don't have to worry about the deficit, what what a deal that would be. I don't think it's correct. I think it's it's wrong. But and we'll, it's going to be lots of debate in the in the campaign. Joe Biden, we'll see. I doubt he's going to be positive about that. We'll see how how he articulates it. The idea of the of the expansion continuing on and on is certainly intriguing, and I would think that should be a, a goal to have, at least have very small recessions, not like we had in 2007, 8, and 9, not like we had in, in the early 80s. Those are devastating to people, and they still have effects. But if you at least can have small ones, that would be a goal. And so I, I'd like to think that's what we're aiming for. That's why I'd like to get policy back to normal. But you have to be careful hoping for that too much, uh, because I've, I've been in this business a long time. There were papers written in the 1960s, is the business cycle, that was the title of a paper, is the business cycle obsolete? Whoops, we just had a big one big one after another. So I think it's, uh, it's good to have that as a goal. I think, I think policy could be better. I think one of the things I look back on um, my thinking about this subject, I wish we had made better progress. I think the recession, deep recession in 2000, Seven, eight, nine was terrible. I recently watched the movie Apollo 11. I don't know if you've seen that. It's documentary films from the times. And uh, President Kennedy said, we're gonna put a man on the moon and bring him back. And 1969, they do it. It's, it's an amazing story. And it's, it's organizational, it's technology, it's political. And just think about on the economic side, see if we could have done something like that, like that Apollo 11 uh, action. And uh, we haven't, and maybe we will, but I think you need something like that to make uh, Jan's uh, hypothesis true. Well, I say here first, I'm sorry, yes? Very quickly, what's, what is your feeling about the inverted yield curve? Is a little louder, sorry? What is your feeling about the inverted yield curve? So this is, uh, the inverted yield curve means that longer rates are uh, lower than shorter rates, and that's happened recently. It, it usually happens before recessions because the Fed will be raising interest rates to combat inflation, and they'll, they, it can't happen forever, so they'll think about, the, say, the 10-year rate is expected value of future short rates, so they see that happening. And recessions have frequently occurred when that occurs. It's happened now. I don't think of it as a harbinger of recession because there's other things. The, the world situation is different. We have, again, Japanese are keeping the 10-year rate low at zero and the Europeans are keeping their rates low. So the, I think, my view, the longer rates are more of a global, they're influenced by global factors. And I think that's what's one of the reasons we have the inverted yield curve now. And of course, it has changed since this policy has changed. It was, it was flattening, but it's really inverted in the last, uh, the last couple of months. So I'm, uh, it, it reflects to me the hope that we'll get back to a normal monetary policy. Uh, and I think and we may have a, a flat inverted yield curve. And, but ultimately, I think it will require the rest of the world to normalizing as well. John, but, yeah. uh, first of all, we should all understand that 
we owe Amy a great deal of gratitude for the years she spent the pitch she spent as an interim head. She did a great job and really was great for the school. So I just want to make sure we all understand that. And that was Tier tax rate with two, two or three deductions for personal income makes sense, you know, 15, 25, and 32 for charity and, 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 and uh, personal home interest rates makes sense for this country. So that's a, 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 sort of a flatter tax? Yeah. So, yeah. In other words, three, three brackets make it simple, several deductions, and call it a day. Uh, why doesn't that make sense? <coughs> So I even go further. Why not just have a complete flat tax? Uh, and uh, my colleague uh, uh, Bob Hall and Alvin Bushka have argued that for a while. It's gotten flatter in many countries. So I think we could do that. But I think the problem is people want some kind of graduation politically in the tax system. So, and they'll just say it's it's not fair to have a 20% tax for the very rich, whatever happens. So I think that's it's just not possible to have it. You could flatten it again. The Ideal tax reform is you, to me, lower the marginal rates and increase the base. So the flat tax or a flatter tax, like you're talking about, three, three would, would entail, have to entail some kind of broadening the base, fewer deductions, which makes a lot of sense to me. It's simple. You know, the, the idea of the whole rubbishka is you had the whole tax system on a postcard. That was their claim to fame. I don't think that's possible, but uh, if you, simplification uh, is, is great, and I would try to do that. But tax reform, I mean, it's hard. The, many people didn't think we'd have a tax change in December 2017, even up all through the summer of 2017. And it happened. So it was all sorts of disputes and debates. So it's hard. It's very hard. Just uh, one quick question. Um, I figured that we're all kind of here because we went to a great school like Shady Side and we were lucky enough to be able to go to that. Uh, yes. But as you mentioned earlier, not everybody has that, and education seems to be a real impetus to get some of the goals that you're talking about through. So my question is, are there any economic, do you have any opinions on economic policies that could attack that widening gap of education that we see in this country, especially, you know, K-12? Yeah, so here I compare um, the U.S. with the colleges and universities versus K-12, and it's quite, quite different. And one difference is there's, there's more independent decision making at most colleges and universities, even the state uh, universities. It's more uh, decentralized. And I think something like that would, be, would work better at the K K-12. By the way, part of the decentralization is the important uh, vibrancy of an independent um, a private school system. And, by, and I, this, I read about the scholarships that are coming for Shadyside. I think that's just terrific, right? Because you're, and, and Stanford has a, look it up, $69,000 per year tuition. However, the average financial aid is 45000 so there's a lot of difference. So that's, a, that's an effort for more flexibility so you can a, attract people that maybe are from a poor, poor school district or haven't had chances and they, and they, get, they get it. And I think the, the financial aid for Shadyside is, is similar to that. But more generally, what do you do about um, the Los Angeles school district? And I think it's some decentralization is useful. So I've long thought that the charter schools are a useful innovation. It provides more independence. It provides the ability to have the teachers that are focused on things. There's not the control from the center. Principals have more authority. So I would, I think that's the answer. I mean, it's been defeated. We had in California, again, sorry for the California examples, there was a, a, a initiative on the ballot to create vouchers. It went down big time. And uh, Milton Friedman was, was behind that at the time. It's a long time ago. But something like that, I think my own view would be positive. I, again, I just, my, my thinking here is that I like the word economic freedom in the sense it provides less regulation, people get to start businesses, there's not a lot of control on what they're trying to do. But we need economic freedom for all. And I just don't think we have economic freedom for all in this country. And that's partly, bec partly because of education. And um, it's, dis it's, it's, it's uh, terrible, and it's very hard to fix. Um, the the um, 
teachers themselves, uh, my, my, my grandkids go to public schools in, in Palo Alto. It's a great public school system. <laughs> but, you know, it's not great all over the place in the state. It's because, you know, we can live there. So it's, um, it may be the number one issue, to, 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 most difficult issue, most controversial. I've I, uh, had some changes. One of, the, one of my public policy experiences that Amy didn't mention was um, the, the school board in Palo Alto. They wanted to, to close some schools, which I didn't think made sense, so I did some research and I found that their economics was all wrong. The demography was not correct. They were not predicting the effect of various tax things. So I, I said, well, I'm just going to tell them. So I went to the school board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you already know what happened. <laughs> okay, Mr. Taylor, you're next. You got three minutes. Okay, my three minutes, I was gone. They just laughed at me. So, but the, so what we did get a, a group of people willing to run, and they got a we did a white paper and spreadsheets, and the the new people won. They overthrew the school board and they changed things. So you you sort of it takes an involvement. What that's a lot of work, and uh, and one of the it, the fact that we can have that at a local level is important, I think. But we want to have the flexibility, but it does require a lot of work uh, to do, and I don't see it just yet. In respect for everyone's time, we have time for two more questions. Okay. okay. Thank you. John, um, recognizing your five points and sort of looking in that perspective, this is sort of one of these questions you would want to knock it down to the eighth grade education level, which is sort of where a lot of PR comes out of most government offices. And if you look at something big that could budget, bust the budget type of thing, where's the trade off for sort of Let's have a huge infrastructure package that says, let's build digital highways, concrete highways, because it'll produce that growth and or productivity type of right. thing. Or maybe we suck a whole bunch of money out of student debt because that's another policy issue or political issue that changes those factors of investment or retraction. And, and I don't know if it's sort of like you're trying to speak logically in front of a school board in three minutes, it's just yeah. not worth it or there's some other medium here that could be. So it's a, it's a very, very good question. I think about it all the time. Um, I teach freshmen. Um, I have a MOOC. <laughs> That's a massive open online course. Um, so it, it, it has to do with talking about this at uh, different levels and making it simple. It's not really so much different levels as making it simple. I, um, I think infrastructure is a problem. Um, I think that if you can use the private sector more, private sector incentives, it might reduce the budget cost, because I think the budget is such a problem. Here, I think the, the we don't recognize there's a lot of improvements you could make in, in, in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, that would make the systems work better. But maybe it's more skin in the game, is sometimes called. We have the system of uh, Social Security so that uh, people who are now 40 are going to get more in real terms than people that are now 70. It's just sort of backwards. So there's things that can be changed, and we need to work on it. It's very political at this point to do so. Um, but I think you're right. You, you, uh, it, it's really important for, for all of us to explain this uh, as best we can so that everybody can get involved. Yeah, I, that's all I can say. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, one more. <laughs> I'm just curious, what do you perceive the long-term forward-looking non-inflationary rate potential to be, and what does your research show it's been over the last 50 to 100 years? So I think that we should think about 3% as a reasonable, it could be, could be higher, but it's, it's productivity. It's actually, at this point, it's almost all productivity. And I don't, I think I see all these incredible inventions and things that are from the internet to medical care, which tr translate to me as huge potential for productivity. So I think 3% th should, should be a goal, and that's uh, not 2%. And there's no reason for me to think we should be lower. There's also, globally, many parts of the world that are just still catching up. I mean, Africa, China, much of Asia, they're still well below the levels of the U.S. and Europe. So they, they can grow faster than that, than they hope they do. So we, they five, six, seven percent, whatever. Africa population growth is expanding, and their, their economies are not expanding. But I think in the U.S., 
there's no reason why we can't have three. Maybe if we do even a little better than that, that would be great. And I, I don't have any problems with the 2% inflation target. I think that's fine. And so that would be 2 plus 3, 5% nominal GDP growth. It would be, be nice. Does, does that help? No, historically, what is it then? Oh, 3% at least, sometimes higher, and some, but sometimes lower. That, those ups and downs I mentioned, you know, we had recessions and slow growth before, but we've come out of it. I think that's the thing you, to me, the advantage of thinking of this as policy, you see there's something that can be done about it. Not, it's not just forever, it's not just secular, it's not just the way it is. And I, I just, you know, think of all the things, I mean, I'd like to have a session where we go back and remind ourselves what it was like in 1964 when I graduated in terms of all the technologies and ability to speak. It was just a completely different world. And I think and one thing is we're going back to the education question. I don't think we're exploiting enough, and, uh, and we're going to meet tomorrow, the Board of uh, Visitors. I don't think we're exploiting enough the technology in education. This is more to, to do with the general population, but I think we could be doing more on that. It, 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 education um, tends to be a little bureaucratic, and it's hard to make changes. And so finding ways to have more flexibility would be good. And I think that would improve people's skills and maybe even uh, increase productivity, but certainly spread um, the gains uh, more broadly. Okay.